Chapter 5 His eyes snapped open, hammered open, and there were these things about himself that he knew instantly. He was unbelievably, viciously thirsty. His mouth was dry and tasted foul and sticky. His lips were cracked and felt as if they were bleeding. And if he did not drink some water soon, he felt that he would wither up and die. Lots of water, all the water he could find. He knew the thirst and felt the burn on his face. It was mid-afternoon and the sun had come over him and cooked him while he slept and his face was on fire, would blister, would peel which did not help the thirst, made it much worse. He stood using the tree to pull himself up because there was still some pain and much stiffness and looked down at the lake. It was water, but he did not know if he could drink it. Nobody had ever told him if you could or could not drink lakes. There was also the thought of the pilot. Down in the blue with the plane strapped in, the body awful, he thought, but the lake was blue and wet looking and his mouth and throat raged with the thirst and he did not know where there might be another form of water he could drink. Besides, he had probably swallowed a ton of it while he was swimming out of the plane and getting to shore. In the movies, they always showed the hero finding a clear spring with pure sweet water to drink. But in the movies, they didn't have plane wrecks and swollen foreheads and aching bodies and thirst that tore at the hero until he couldn't think. Brian took small steps down the bank to the lake. Along the edge, there were thick grasses and the water looked a little murky and there were small things swimming in it, water, in the water, small bugs. But there was a log extending about 20 feet out into the water of the lake. A beaver dropped from some time before with old limbs sticking up almost like handles. He balanced on the log, holding himself up with the limbs and teetered out past the weeds and murky water. When he was out where the water was clear and he could see no bugs swimming, he kneeled on the log to drink. A sip, he thought, still worrying about the lake water. I'll just take a sip. But when he brought a cupped hand to his mouth and felt the cool, cold water trickle past his cracked lips and over his tongue, he could not stop. He had never, not even on long bike trips in the hot summer, been this thirsty. It was as if the water were more than water, as if the water had become all of life, and he could not stop. He stooped and put his mouth to the lake and drank and drank, pulling in deep and swallowing great gulps of it. He drank until his stomach was swollen, until he nearly fell off the log with it. Then he rose and staggered, tripped his way back to the bank where he immediately was immediately sick and threw up most of the water. But his thirst was gone, and the water seemed to reduce the pain in his head as well, although the sunburn still cooked his face. So, he almost jumped with the word spoken aloud. It seemed so out of place, the sound. He tried it again. So, so, so here I am. And there it is, he thought, for the first time since the crash, his mind started to work. His brain triggered, and he began thinking, Here I am, and where is that? Where am I? He pulled himself once more up the bank to the tall tree without branches and sat again with his back against the rough bark. It was hot now, but the sun was high and... But the sun was high into his rear, and he sat in the shade of the tree in relative comfort. There were things to sort out. Here I am, and that is nowhere. With his mind opened and thoughts happening in all tried to come in with a rush, all of what had occurred, and he could not take it. The whole thing turned into a confused jumble that made no sense. So he fought it down and tried to take one thing at a time. He had been flying north to visit his father for a couple of months in the summer and the pilot had had a heart attack and had died and the plane had crashed somewhere in the Canadian North Woods but he did not know how far he had flown 
or in what direction or where he was. Slow down, he thought, slow down more. My name is Brian Robeson and I am 13 years old and I am alone in the north woods of Canada. All right, he thought, that's simple enough. I was flying to visit my father and the plane crashed and sank in the lake. There, keep it that way, short thoughts. I do not know where I am, which doesn't mean much. More to the point, they do not know where I am. They, meaning anybody who might be wanting to look for me, the searchers. They would look for him, look for the plane. His father and mother would be frantic. They would tear the tear the world apart to find him. Brian had seen searches on the news, seen movies about lost planes. When a plane went down, they mounted extensive searches and almost always they found the plane within a day or two. Pilots all filed flight plans, a detailed plan for where and when they were going to fly with all the courses explained. They would come. They would look for him. The searchers would get government planes and cover both sides of the flight plan filed by the pilot and search until they found him. Maybe even today. They might come today. This was the second day after the crash. No, Brian frowned. Was it the first day or the second day? They had gone down in the afternoon and he had spent the whole night out cold. So this was the first real day. But they could still come today. They would have started the search immediately when Brian's plane did not arrive. Yeah, they would probably come today. Probably come in here with amphibious planes, small bush planes with floats that could land right here on the lake and pick him up and take him home. Which home? The father home or the mother home? He stopped the thinking. It didn't matter. Either on to his dad's or back to his mother. Either way, he would probably help be home by late night or early morning. Home where he could sit down and eat a large, cheesy, juicy burger with tomatoes, with double fries, with ketchup, and a thick chocolate shake. And there came hunger. Brian rubbed his stomach. The hunger had been there, but something else, fear, pain, had held it down. Now with the thought of the burger, the emptiness roared at him. He could not believe the hunger, had never felt it this way. The lake water had filled his stomach, but left it hungry. And now it demanded food, screamed for food. And there he, and there was, he thought, absolutely nothing to eat. Nothing. What did they do in the movies when they got stranded like this? Oh, yes, the hero usually found some kind of plant that he knew was good to eat and that took care of it. Just ate the plant until he was full or used some kind of cute trap to catch an animal and cook it over a slick little fire and pretty soon he had a full eight-course meal. The trouble, Brian thought, looking around, was that all he could see was grass and brush. There was nothing obvious to eat, and aside from a, a million birds and the beaver, he hadn't seen animals to trap and cook. And even if he got one somehow, he didn't have any matches, so he couldn't have a fire. Nothing. It kept coming back to that. He had nothing. Well, almost nothing. As a matter of fact, he thought, I don't know what I've got or haven't got. Maybe I should try and figure out just how, how I stand. It will give me something, something to do, keep me from thinking of food until they come to find me. Brian had once had an English teacher, a guy named Perpich, who was always talking about being positive, thinking positive, staying on top of things. That's how Perpich had put it. Stay positive and stay on top of things. Brian thought of him now. Wonder how to stay positive and stay on top of this. All Perpich would say is, I have to get motivated. He was always telling kids to get motivated. Brian changed position so he was sitting on his knees. He reached into his pockets and took out everything he had and laid it on the grass in front of him. It was pitiful enough. A quarter, three dimes, a nickel, and two pennies. A fingernail clipper a billfold with a $20 bill, 
in case you get stranded at the airport in some small town and have to buy food, his mother had said, and some odd pieces of paper. And now, and on his belt, somehow still there, the hatchet his mother had given him. He had forgotten it and now reached around and took it out and put it on the grass. There was a touch of rust already forming on the cutting edge of the blade, and he rubbed it off with his thumbs. That was it. He frowned. No, wait. If he was going to play the game, might as well play it right. For Pitch would tell him to quit messing around. Get motivated. Look at all of it, Robeson. He had on a pair of good tennis shoes, now almost dry, and socks, and jeans and underwear and a thin leather belt and a t-shirt, with a windbreaker so torn it hung on him in tatters, and a watch. He had a digital watch still on his wrist, but it was broken from the crash, the little screen blank, and he took it off and almost threw it away, but stopped the hand motion and lay the watch on the grass with the rest of it. There, that was it. No, wait, one more thing. Well, those were all the things he had, but he also had himself. Perpich used to drum that into them. You are your most valuable asset. Don't forget that. You are the best thing you have. Brian looked around again. I wish you were here, Perpich. I'm hungry, and I trade everything I have for a hamburger. I'm hungry, he said it aloud in normal tones at first, then louder and louder until he was yelling, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. When he stopped, there was a sudden silence, not just from him, but the clicks and blurps and bird sounds of the forest as well. The noise of his voice had startled everything, and it was quiet. He looked around, listened with his mouth open, and realized that in all his life he had never heard silence before. Complete silence. There had always been some sound, some kind of sound. It lasted only a few seconds, but it was so intense that it seemed to become part of him. Nothing. There was no sound. Then the bird started again, and some kind of buzzing insect, and then a chattering and cawing, and soon there was the same background of sound, which left him still hungry. Of course, he thought, putting the coins and rest back in his pocket and the hatchet in his belt. Of course, if they come tonight, or even if it takes as long as tomorrow, the hunger is no big thing. People have gone for many days without food, as long as they've got water. Even if they don't come until late tomorrow, I'll be all right. Lose a little weight, maybe, but the first hamburger and malt and fries will bring it right back. A mental picture of hamburger, the way they show it in the television commercials, thundered into his thoughts. Rich colors, the meat juicy and hot. He pushed the picture away. So even if they didn't find him until tomorrow, he thought he would be all right. He had plenty of water, although he wasn't sure if it was good and clean or not. He sat again by the tree, his back against it. There was a thing bothering him. He wasn't quite sure what it was, but it kept chewing at the edge of his thoughts. Something about the plane and the pilot that would change things. Ah, there it was. The moment when the pilot had his... The moment the pilot had his heart attack, his right foot had jerked down on the rudder pedal and the plane had slewed sideways. What did that mean? Why did that keep coming into his thinking that way, nudging and pushing? It means, a voice in his thoughts said, they might not be coming for you tonight or even tomorrow. When the pilot pushed the rudder pedal, the plane had jerked to the side and assumed a new course. Brian could not remember how much it had pulled around, but it wouldn't have to be much because after that, with the pilot dead, Brian had flown for hour after hour on the new course. Well, well away from the flight plan the pilot had filed. Many hours at maybe 160 miles an hour. Even if it was only a little off course with that speed and time, Brian might now be sitting several hundred miles off to the side of the recorded flight plan. And they would probably search most heavily at first along the flight plan course. They might go out to the side a little, 
but he could easily be three, four hundred miles to the side. He could not know, could not think of how far he might have flown wrong because he didn't know the original course and didn't know how much that he had pulled sideways. Quite a bit, that's how he remembered it, quite a jerk to the side. It pulled his head over sharply when the plane had swung around. They might not find him for two or three days. He felt his heartbeat increase as the fear started. The thought was there, but he fought it down for a time, pushed it away, then it exploded out. They might not find him for a long time. And the next thought was there as well. They might not never find him, but that was panic and he fought it down and tried to stay positive. They searched hard when a plane went down. They used many men and planes and they would go to the side. They would know he was off from the flight path. He had talked to the man on the radio. They would somehow know it would be all right. They would soon find him, maybe not tomorrow, but soon, soon, soon. They would find him soon. Gradually, like sloshing oil, his thoughts settled back and the panic was gone. Say they didn't come for two days. No, say they didn't come for three days. Even push that to four days. He could live with that. He would have to live with that. He didn't want to think of them taking longer, but say four days. He had to do something. He couldn't just sit at the bottom of this tree and stare down at the lake for four days. And night. He was in deep woods and didn't have any matches, couldn't make a fire. There were large things in the woods. There were wolves, he thought, and bears, other things. In the dark, he would be in the open here, just sitting at the bottom of a tree. He looked around suddenly, felt the hair on the back of his neck go up. Things might be looking at him right now, waiting for him, waiting for dark so they could move in and take him. He fingered the hatchet at his belt. It was the only weapon he had, but it was something. He had to have some kind of shelter. No, make that more. He had to have some kind of shelter and he had to have something to eat. He pulled himself to his feet and jerked the back of his shirt down before the mosquitoes could get at it. He had to do something for himself. I have to get motivated, he thought, remembering per pitch. Right now, I'm all I've got. I have to do something.